Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Manila House, this is Bambina Olivares, a Director of Programming, welcoming members and non-members alike to today's webinar, The West Philippine Sea, Perils and Prospects, with retired Colonel Dennis Akop. Today's webinar is presented in partnership with PSA Philippines Agency. The West Philippine Sea, or the South China Sea, as some people may call it, has been a contentious issue for years now and a major source of tension in, um, in between um, the Philippines and China. In 2016, an international tribunal at The Hague ruled in favor of the Philippines, saying that China's expansive claims of sovereignty over swaths of the Ch South China Sea had no legal or historical basis. The tribunal also said that China had violated international law by causing irreparable harm to the marine environment, endangering Philippine ships, and interfering with Philippine fishing and oil exploration. The current administration has largely ignored what was considered a landmark victory for the Philippines. And in the run-up to the 2022 elections, Philippine sovereignty and our relationship with China will be a hot issue. So to discuss all that today, we are privileged to have with us retired Colonel um, Dennis Ako. Now, let me just, by way of introduction, let me just say that um, retired um, Colonel Dencho, Dennis Ako, PhD, is a private security practitioner. He's a soldier, private security practitioner, academic, um, from the uh, a speaker, a writer, and athlete. He graduated from the US Military Academy at West Point in 1983. He served in the Philippine Consulary, Philippine Army, and Presidential Security Group. During his armed forces career, Dennis was qualified as a combat parachutist, scuba diver, and intelligence counterterrorism and special forces operator. He was a pioneer member of the elite PC PNP Special Action Force, or SAF, battalion. For his excellent service rendered to the nation, he was awarded the Distinguished Star, Sir, Distinguished Service Star, Distinguished Conduct Star, as well as the Presidential Medal of Merit. Upon retiring from the armed forces in 2006 with the rank of Colonel, Dennis pivoted his significant experience and expertise to the private sector, working as a director for several Fortune 500 companies. A believer in lifelong learning, Dennis holds a PhD in Peace and Security Administration from Bicol University, as well as three master's degrees, UNSW, UP, and PCU. He is trained in disaster management with Cranfield University in the UK, and is a certified protection, protection professional or CPP by ASIS and AMBICI certified business community, uh, certified by the Business Community Institute, sorry, Business Continuity Institute in the UK. Now, um, before we begin, let me just go through some ground rules. I'd also like to say that Sam Ramos Jones from PSA Philippines Agency will join me later on to moderate the discussion with Colonel Ako. Hi, Sam. So before we could begin, just a few ground rules. This webinar is being recorded and will be up on the Manila House YouTube channel in a day or two. Please use the chat box and the Q&A box for any questions and comments, and we'll get to your questions as we go along. Thank you. Now, um, let me turn you over to Colonel Ako. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, Babine, for the very kind introduction. I'm, I'm happy to be here and uh, would be uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to discuss the West Philippine Sea issue topic this afternoon with you. And I'll just go ahead with my presentation and then uh, hopefully we'll be able to discuss with you um, afterwards. The West Philippine Sea topic is a very hot topic nowadays. And uh, this afternoon, I, I, I hope to share, to talk more about it, especially focusing on parents and, and prospects. So I'll just go on right ahead with my uh, presentation. In order to be able to really understand the, the West Philippine Sea issue, it is quite imperative to, to you know, review a little bit about China. Uh, most of us probably you know, haven't had the chance to really uh, know the history behind uh, China. Even even I myself was able. You know, I had to look it up a bit, even with my years of experience with the Philippine military. But uh, but then again, reviewing a bit about the history of China allows us to better appreciate what's really going on. 
Um, <clears throat> again, if uh, we, we, we must understand that in 2012, there was a change in leadership in, the chi in China's leadership from uh, Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping. And uh, since then, in 2012, we've seen some dramatic changes with regards to, to how, how China uh, operates in the world. And uh, there's mention of China 2049, and it, it 2049 actually depicts 100 years since uh, China's founding in 1949 with the victory of the, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so in the run-up to, to that year, uh, the Chinese Communist Party under the leadership of Xi Jinping vowed to really go on ahead with some some. Uh, you know, even we may call you know radical developments uh, that hasn't happened before quite in contrast to the uh, how Xi Jinping's predecessors approached uh, China's involvement with the world. So in understanding the way China operates today, when when we talk of China 2049, it actually it actually has something to do with 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 uh, with China's history going back to 1839, when uh, it believed it was humiliated by, uh, by its uh, twice defeat in the Opium Wars. The first Opium War against, against Great Britain, and then the second Opium War against both Great Britain and uh, France. And it, it's quite a long story, but it, 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 it has something to do with, uh, with basically China losing uh, both wars and since then, you know, having had to deal with, with a world that it felt, you know, it got dictated on uh, to its, to its uh, disadvantage. And that's where the Chinese nation is coming from when it talks about, you know, uh, its dream of 2049 and trying to change, change uh, things, right? So, uh, and so, and Xi Jinping therefore said, uh, all right, uh, you know, under my leadership, we're going to be, it's my goal for us to be, become moderately prosperous, to become a moderately prosperous society by 2021, which is this year, and uh, fully developed, rich and powerful, and probably even an understatement, you know, because by, by 2049, uh, to my research, my belief, China hopes to be uh, the, the, the world superpower by then, you know, challenging the United States and basically the, the Western democracies. And, um, and from uh, Graham Allison, uh, China under Xi Jinping, you know, uh, believes that uh, they want to return China to the predominance it enjoyed in Asia before the West intruded, again, going back to the Opium Wars to be able to reestablish control over the territories the Communist Party considers to be greater China. This includes not only Xinjiang and Tibet on the mainland, but uh, the reclaiming of Taiwan. And of course, uh, and Hong Kong, which is already under its control. To recover its historic sphere of influence along its borders and in the adjacent seas so that others give it that deference Great nations have always demanded, and I think we're already seeing that with the developments in the South China Sea and, and other parts of uh, the world which China has engaged, especially with, uh, with its Belt and Road Initiative, which I'm going to discuss in the next few slides. And of course, to command the respect of the world uh, in its quest, that's why uh, you know, it hopes to become a, a, a world power, just like the, the Western democracies. And again, if we take a closer look at China, we can see that you know most of its really the the greatest part of its population is concentrated to the east. Ninety four percent, you know, are are situated in like uh, a uh, less than fifty percent part of the uh, Chinese Chinese geographical area, as you can see, and. Um, and China believes that 
its east coast is hemmed in by neighboring countries which are which are allied with, with western powers particularly the united states so it has felt a little bit uncomfortable with this situation and later on i'm going to discuss about more more specifically about how why china feels uh, thus you know it it, is, it has something to do with uh, with not only politics but the economics you know uh, for instance in terms of oil uh, be, being uh, cut off from certain trade routes and and uh, its quest to have uh, a better better access in in other parts of the world so the BRI or the Belt and Road Initiative, in part, is, is China's idea of how to mitigate this this problem. All right. So um, it uh, part part of its oil it gets from uh, it. China needs to continuously gain uh, oil from other parts of the world, from Venezuela, uh, for instance, and in the Middle East, but. But its problem is that uh, it is too dependent on passing through the Strait of Malacca. And it is the belief of analysts that it needs another alternate route, uh, gaining access to oil from, from, uh, from other parts of the world that needs to pass through the Pacific. And uh, if it is at odds with, with the US, for instance, or Japan, uh, then it is unable to do so, and that is why the uh, the Philippines practice and or its dominance in the South China Sea becomes significant. You've seen from that from the context, and, and I'll show that uh, a little while. Um, okay, here, here we uh, and and this slide, for instance, shows that you know uh, it's it's a planned uh, Silk Road economic belt access to, to, uh, to Russia. Uh, it, it has a on and off relationship with, with Russia, I would say. Uh, it, it depends on, on uh, which part of the national interest of each country becomes affected. Uh, sometimes it is a uh, better terms with with the uh, partner Russia sometimes uh, not so well and we can see here the the planned maritime Silk Road and this has something to do with the uh, and uh, China's strategy has been the BRI or the Belt and Road Initiative wherein it has tried to partner with the uh, global South countries or the developing world which is in need of development money and certainly China has lots of liquidity and it has tried to, to partner with these uh, smaller or well, relatively smaller uh, developing countries in need of development money. And but unfortunately, you know, the developments that we have learned is that uh, sometimes these uh, relationships have not always turned out well for the partner country, especially when it when the time comes wherein it is unable to pay off its debt then you know, uh, then it is subject to China's demand of um, probably having to relinquish certain of its uh, uh, national attributes, including some of its natural resources, even ports like uh, Sri Lanka and Djibouti. And uh, in, in my analysis, it has something to do with, with a connection between China's political aims, as well as its commercial aims, and also as well as its political aims, even militarily, because China, unlike any other nation, is, is, really, is really in a, in a class of its own. Uh, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party is so huge. It's like uh, 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 eight, uh, 8 million uh, in membership in a population of 1.4 billion. And it's like and China operates now like a, the biggest, the world's biggest multinational corporation. So it is able to advance its uh, national interest, which is really the role of the government, in partnership with its private sector, uh, which is really uh, you know a, a partnership that is unlike any other. So it is able to do all of these things, uh, 
uh, again, we have to understand that before I proceed, I, I just would like to understand to emphasize that Ch uh, China under Xi Jinping really wanted to wanted wanted to he had he had four goals in mind. Again, firstly to to return China to uh, to its predominance before uh, Western intrusion. That's number one. Number two, reestablish control over Greater China. You know that that includes trying to get back Taiwan. Okay. Number three, recover of recover its sphere of influence in its borders and adjacent seas. I mentioned that earlier, but again, I would just like to reemphasize, and that is why uh, that probably explains its its uh, more aggressive actions in the in the South China Sea and uh, and its immediate immediate uh, vicinity. And and fourth, China wants respect in the world. Uh, again, going back to uh, 1839, the Opium Wars. It, and, and everything, everything that happened in between, it, it wants to, it wants respect in the world. It, it thinks that it can challenge uh, the G7 or the great Western democracy, even, even the United States in becoming a world power. And to be able to do that, Xi Jinping uh, has, you know, uh, embarked on four uh, action agenda. First, to reestablish a strong communist party, which, which he has done. He has overhauled it, uh, disciplined it, Secondly, uh, he's made China uh, an economic power, and China is an economic power. Third, it, it has made uh, China proud again, proud of their identity. So even the things that we see now happening around the world in terms of food security, th these are all for the people of China. You know, uh, it, it, it's, it, everything brings goes back to the people of China and making them proud once again, that you know that the Communist Party is able to take care of them, provide for them, and not only that, but regain the respect that China has lost over the years. Okay, so and then fourth, Xi Jinping wants uh, China to be strong again, to be strong again. It has overhauled the People's Liberation Army. It's making it one of the strongest in the world. To the point of challenging the great powers, including the United States. So that's that's what's going on at, in a in a uh, geo in a strategic sense to be able to understand all of this. All right. Now um, that brings us to the strategic importance of the West Philippine Sea or or the South China Sea. Uh, there there are overlaps here. Again, it's good for us to be able to understand that. Uh, Presently, China, the, wor the world's largest, is the world's largest, one of the world's largest importer of uh, oil. And, and much of that comes from imports. It doesn't really, it has, but it has very limited amounts of oil, maybe around, 20, estimated that around 25 uh, billion barrels of oil a day, but that's not enough. And that is why it continues to, to, to import. That's just a small uh, portion of what it actually needs. And again, it goes back to what I was trying to emphasize earlier about gaining access to oil imports all the way from Venezuela, for instance, which is in the South, which is in South America or, or the Middle East and everything passes through the Malacca Strait. Uh, and China has uh, this problem with India. So the Indian Ocean is not exactly uh, uh, a 100% safe haven for Chinese trade. So it is the is it is the analysis of, of uh, some, including me, that it needs alternate trade routes, including the Pacific, and therefore it needs a free passage through, especially the South China Sea, which uh, it has claimed, and it has the nine dash line, uh, nine dash line system, which it believes. Uh, to be its own and it uses to challenge the UNCLOS. So anyway, we'll, we'll talk more about that later on. So it, China sees the Pacific as an alternate trade route uh, apart, from the, apart from the Strait of Palapa. All right. If the Straits were shattered to China Strait, the detours could entail passage through the Spratly Islands. Okay. And as we can see here, 
if not if the Malacca Strait was unpassable, then you know China would only be looking at the Lombok Strait, for instance, and that has been a very traditional trade route that the, it has used uh, through the centuries. And uh, going around Australia, even which is a very far out route, if it if its soil is still coming from the Middle East and uh, South America, but over to the east, as, as I was saying earlier, uh, its need for for a clear passage through the the South China Sea is by way of getting access through the Pacific uh, to be able to access resources in the in the Pacific itself. And uh, there's been a lot of lots of developments about China's trying to use even BRI to um, to partner with a lot many small Pacific nations, including the Philippines, uh, in Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands, and the, the small nations in the Pacific, and to be able to gain access uh, through them or to them to their natural resources, even or probably have uh, gained gain ports and access basically. And, and not to mention any access that, that would be possible to these nations' natural resources. And, and the Philippines is a very good example. Okay, so, so, uh, so again, we can just look at the, the resource wealth of the West Philippine Sea. You know, the West Philippine Sea has passed and largely untapped carbon fuel reserves. Uh, some estimated that 11 billion barrels of oil, 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. If uh, things are fully developed, the West Philippine Sea accounts for 12% of global fish catch. That's a lot. And, uh, and the area uh, is part of, for, of the, the, the so-called Coral Triangle, which is the planet's richest center of marine life and coral diversity. You know, it, it is this triangle that, that runs from uh, Japan all the way down to the Solomon Islands, down to parts of Indonesia. And it's just, it's just rich with all kinds of, uh, of uh, rich marine life. And of course, uh, there's been overfishing in the, in the waters closest to China. I mean, China needs to feed 1.4 billion people. Uh, the resources that are available within its territorial natural resources could only feed up to 25% of that population. So obviously it needs to get the, the rest of uh, its food security from, from uh, outside. So even, even that alone is already a uh, very strong motive for, uh, for, for China's aggressive actions, especially in the South China Sea, which uh, has a lot of food security, uh, not to mention oil and gas reserves. Okay. Okay. We've heard of the, the cabbage tactic. You know, you know, everyone knows uh, what that what cabbage is, right? It's just layers and layers of, of leaves. And uh, even as we speak right now, the uh, the around two hundred eighty seven maritime Chinese vessels in the uh, San Felipe Reef. In the, in the West Philippine Sea are still there. And this is the second time that's been done. The first, the first one was at the uh, Scarborough Shoal. And, uh, and the Chinese vessels never left Scarborough Shoal, even if they haven't put up any uh, concrete structures there. But the structures, the presence, the Chinese presence is, is uh, in the vessels that are still there. And so right now, at uh, Whitson or the San Felipe Reef, which is within the Philippines exclusive economic zone, the 287 maritime vessels are still there, are still there. And, uh, and it is to, to our belief that, again, Chinese uh, strategy is like, it's, it's four tiered. First, to, to occupy and exploit. So the, China, the, the big, Vessels are there to establish presence, Chinese presence in, in, in the area. They okay, occupy. Then and there, there are so many. I mean, perhaps the number of vessels that are, are there uh, depend on, on the area that needs to be occupied. So and then once there, they, they stay there. 
and they exploit they exploit the area. Secondly, to militarize and reclaim. Militarize and reclaim. I'm not, I'm not really sure about reclaim. You know, I, I don't I don't know why they uh, why they call it reclaim because uh, it's some of some of these islands and islets are really within the exclusive economic zones of, of uh, sovereign nations, including the Philippines. So, but it's military, for example, at the Spratly's Islands, they've built uh, runways, hangars, uh, military installations. So they've, they've militarized, perhaps to, to defend any, uh, since they, in their minds, they think they think that uh, these are their heirs, then they, they protect it and try to defend. From any intruders, it becomes the other way around. If you're, uh, if you're like uh, one of the claimants, uh, especially if it's, uh, if it lies, if the teacher lies within your exclusive economic zone, then, then it, it's a it's a total contrast to what the, the Chinese are are claiming to do. Okay, and then thirdly, to secure and solidify its presence, so it stays there, build structures, build, build, build. Uh, all kinds and and to the point that perhaps any uh, any of the claimant nations would uh, have a hard time really uh, reclaiming back what what is probably theirs uh, legally in the first place. And fourthly, uh, to develop and utilize uh, resources. For instance, it is now found out that uh, the the Chinese also put up science and research laboratories in these areas, like at uh, Whitson and. and at, uh, and at the uh, parts of the Kalayan or Sprati Islands and also Scarborough, they conduct marine research to, I guess, to, to study the, the area, determine what, what's, what's in there, uh, what can be done about it, how, how to go about it, things of that sort. And certainly in, in the case of the Philippines, they are a lot more sophisticated. So, and the Philippines has, is catch, catching on and also trying to develop uh, it's equivalent research capability, uh, even if it realizes that uh, the China is uh, far ahead in this regard. All right, and uh, China believes that because of its power, its uh, economic and military strength, it has, the, it has everything that is needed to be able to, to do, the, do this. And uh, there's probably not much neighbors can, can do, especially the weaker neighbors. All right. Uh, so we now move on to the real build, 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 and you know, this this slide shows uh, what I just uh, said earlier about uh, how 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 China uh, tries to to uh, concretize its its strategic goals, and uh, like I said, uh, for them, its possession is ninety percent. Uh, island building is meant to augment the status quo uh, in at least two ways. It changes the strategic balance because by occupying these areas, which were unoccupied before, then uh, right now it, it's, re it's really uh, re-established the balance. Of course, claimants are objecting, including the Philippines, but uh, again, you know, it, it, and, I, I, and I'll explain this a little bit more in the next slide, how, why, why China sees it differently. All right. Also, by, by challenging the international legal order. So, of course, we are all aware that there is an existing international legal order, but uh, China sees it a little bit differently. And, and again, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But of course, the implications of these activities uh, of China, well, there's, there's consequent environmental degradation. For instance, in the, in the build, build, build. Of course, it, even in the Philippines, in the, in the Spratlys, for instance, They've, uh, they've, they've built uh, structures over reefs and islets and uh, through the destruction of the, uh, the marine and natural marine resources underneath because of the, because of the obstructions. But the Chinese believe that doing such uh, is able to deliver a buffer zone between the Pacific and the Chinese mainland. And this has something to do with perhaps uh, a not so imaginary protagonist like, like, like the US or the, or the Western or the other Western 
powers, like even including India and Japan, which are part of the Quad Nations, uh, this access to the Pacific through the South China Sea. And of course, if you go further out, then of course, it, it, you eventually uh, lead to the, the, to the United States. So strategically, the, the Chinese, we believe, you know, believes that, you know, creating all of these uh, structures which can serve commercial as well as military purposes uh, from, from its territory through the South China Sea, out to the Pacific, they create some kind of a, a buffer zone between them and the United States, uh, among others, right? Also, uh, it's being able to do this, create islands out of, out of you know, what, what's, uh, what's normally impossible for other nations to do, is a power projection. It, it projects itself as a, as a uh, power of, of sorts, you know, scientific power, military power, economic power, so it's it's a it's a power project. It's like being able to extend your territory out there, right? And of course, commercial dominance. Uh, it, it 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 naturally falls right into you know China's place as a uh, economic superpower. In fact, number number one in terms of economic growth for so many years. Okay, uh, let's take a uh, closer look at the Scarborough Shoal. Uh, Scarborough is part of the uh, the Philippines exclusive economic zone, which is uh, within 200 nautical miles from, from the mainland. Right? And uh, since 2012, the year Xi Jinping took over power in China, uh, China has maintained a permanent presence, as, as I've said earlier, and de facto control. Okay? And despite the 2016 arbitral award to the Philippines, in fact, and, and again, I would explain why, why it is different to it has a totally different uh, interpretation of it. And uh, ironically, even Filipino fishermen have been constantly harassed, chased out of uh, the area, even if it lies within the Filipino exclusive economic zone and, and the local fisher folk have been, have been fishing there for, for years, even decades. Uh, even if there is, there has been no major artificial island that has been built at Scarborough. Still, you know, can you you can just imagine if it's if uh, China is able to build something there, uh, just like it did at uh, Kalayan Island or the Spratlys. And by the way, the Scarborough is just Scarborough is just above, as we can see, uh, it's right, it's just above uh, the Spratlys. It's uh, closer to uh, Zambales province uh, to the north. Okay, now. Uh, we now try to understand a little bit more about how, you know, how China thinks and its strategy towards what it is doing in the world uh, today. You can see how everything is uh, connected as, as we go through these uh, remaining slides. And the, the Philippines is much involved in it. And uh, uh, the Chinese believes in the, the three warfares. Even if we have been told time and again that uh, we cannot afford a war with China, and that is primarily because our thinking is based on a kinetic understanding of what war is. You know, when when we, when we hear war, right? If you think of all, all the all, all the wars that have happened in our lifetime: First World War, Second World War, Vietnam War, and th these are kinetic wars. These are actual wars where you know, people shoot at each other. But from the Chinese perspective, there are other kinds of warfare, and it is already pretty, very much in it. And these include psychological, media, and legal warfare. And these are not your usual shooting wars, right? But to them, it is already war. They are actually, in fact, at war with the world, even if the world doesn't maybe realize it yet. All right. So, um, uh, uh, so their their belief is somewhat different. They 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 uh, these beliefs come from you know, the teachings of Sun Tzu, even Mao Zedong, and they emphasize winning. Uh, you know, I am reminded of Bruce Lee. <laughs> you know, he said, uh, you know, uh, fighting without fighting or, or or winning without fighting, and and they believe that. At the same time, they are also ahead in case 
everything leads to a shooting war. They also believe that by putting things in advance, then they would be ahead in terms of kinetic escalation. So, and uh, they adapt these three kinds of unorthodox warfare because they, they support one another and they are protracted. They can go on uh, forever. So there's psychological, media, and legal warfare. Okay. And uh, here, this slide here, the, the image shows just a, just a you know, theoretical representation of the, the different spectra of nation state warfare operations. And uh, by looking at these and looking where China is right now, you can probably see how, how uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's three types of warfare already fall, fall within, below the threshold of force. But, uh, but of course, it keeps the world guessing because the world sees that China also is developing a very strong military through the, the People's Liberation Army. So it, it, even that is already part of the psychological warfare that China imposes on the world, right? And, you know, it, the world believes that if here is a nation that keeps on developing its, uh, its, its army to become the, the strongest army in the world, probably enough to, to challenge the strongest armies of the West, like the US, UK, or any of the G7 countries, then there's always that supposition that, oh, China is preparing for war. Uh, but that's not necessarily so though. Uh, again, and if we look at this, because uh, it's part of China's credibility as a world power, right? If you know power, then aspiring to be a world power, you know, it knows that the world will not take it seriously if it doesn't have a credible army. So again, you know the saying that you have a, you have to have a credible army to back up your diplomacy. So China knows that too well, and it knows that you know, that is the fate of every global power to be able to have a very credible armed forces, and, and that's that's why uh, China is fully developing its. Uh, it's uh, PLA, the People's Liberation Army, in every respect, in every respect, and uh, and, and this is documented even. There are really no uh, mystery, mysteries to, to this uh, this point. Okay, so if we just uh, talk a little bit more about uh, each of those warfares, psychological warfare, for instance, um, seeks to undermine it, uh, an enemy's ability to conduct combat operations through operations aimed at Stirring, shocking, and demoralizing enemy military personnel and supporting civilian populations. So uh, it, it has done this with with, uh, with with smaller smaller well, man, many of the the nations it's it's face, including the claimants in the South China Sea, are relatively smaller than China. But, uh, it has just been conducting this with regards to them for years now. And, um, and its methods, including, uh, it just, it just probably, it takes advantage of any available method to, uh, to be able to solve this. And in actual practice, it's about, it's, it does, it does just about anything, including diplomatic pressure, for instance, in the Philippines recently, uh, the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, of course, explicitly objected against Chinese occupation in, in, in the San Felipe Reef, and uh, and uh, you know the, the Chinese Chinese envoy said, uh, 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 be be more professional or don't use uh, a diplomatic language." Things like that. So every channel is used, okay, including uh, including shooing away, including shooing away Filipino fishermen from being able to fish in, in our own EEZs, things like that. So, and these are centrally, these are coordinated actions. These are not isolated actions by, for instance, you know, maritime vessels in the South China Sea, but these are, these also have connections with, uh, you know, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it's a research and cultural exchange exchanges. So every channel is pretty much uh, used okay, in engaging. Okay, another is media warfare or public opinion. So 
this you guys are probably already aware of this it's happening a lot in social media you know the attempts to influence domestic and international public opinion to support the we really call it a, a china narrative a china way of looking at things uh, as opposed to any other so again all all media are, are used uh, all existing platforms and media are, are being used um, whether official unofficial all, all kinds of channels really okay and thirdly there's the legal warfare it may be uh, it, it sounds a bit paradoxical or even an oxymoron but, uh, but legal warfare right because there there's two right there there's international uh, rule of law you know these are the these are the rules that are observed by the international community the international criminal court even even the uh, even domestic uh, legal codes observed by by democratic states, uh, but for China it has a little bit uh, uh, different way of looking at it, and uh, it uses international and domestic law to claim the legal high ground, but but of course to uh, to certain national interests just like everybody else, right? But uh, they, they're also used to thwart opponents. Uh, to keep opponents uh, off balance. For instance, for instance, we believe most signatories to uh, the UNCLOS as members of the United Nations uh, observe, naturally observe the, the UNCLOS, right? Uh, 200, no 200 nautical miles, they, are, they fall within your exclusive economic zone and you have exclusive rights. And, and most countries are signatory to that, including China, the Philippines, and all the, the claimants, the, Islands in the South China Sea, but nevertheless, China has its own claim. Despite that, despite being a member of UN, being a signatory to the UNCLOS, it has its, it has its own uh, domestic interpretation of, of uh, history and uh, legal rights, which it calls its nine nine, and which is just totally in uh, in contrast to the UNCLOS, because if you look. If you follow the nine dash line, it uh, it basically says that much of the uh, South China Sea, about ninety percent of the South China Sea, belongs to China, and even even that already uh, sounds illogical when it when it comes to, uh, uh, to international passage, right? That is why there is UNCLOS because it allows for for a for uh, international sea lanes for international trade to come through. So with, with the nine dash line, that would be impossible. All right, and of course, uh, there's the Hague ruling or the, uh, for instance, in the case of the Philippines, we, we won that arbitral award in 2016. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's supposed to be very simple from that point on, right? Uh, it would have prevented all of these incursions into the Philippines exclusive economic zone. If uh, both, if, if China uh, abided by the ruling, but uh, fortunately it, it didn't. And as, as we can see from even existing actions right now, there, there are still uh, unwelcome Chinese vessels within the Philippines exclusive economic zone. Fortunately, uh, Philippine authorities uh, have seemed to not be too adamant into, uh, into following through or building upon the arbitral ruling, which uh, happened uh, at the exit of the previous administration and uh, which would have been followed up by the existing administration here. All right. Um, so uh, we, we can see a little bit of a uh, different uh, interpretation when it comes to, to China's interpretation of how it sees things. Uh, even if it is a member of the world body and uh, has has been used to been following uh, international uh, rule of order, but now it's uh, acting a little bit differently uh, since 2012 under the leadership of Xi Jinping. Okay, so again, uh, more on the Hague ruling before the 2016 arbitral ruling. Um, and uh, 
and this is part of the challenge of even uh, the uh, the uh, domestic um, leadership and governance uh, in the Philippines because uh, <clears throat> because uh, despite the 2016 arbitral ruling, our own President Duterte has said that uh, the ruling is just a piece of paper. Uh, Contrary to the to what really the tooling is all about, and uh, it's a bit it's a bit confusing and uh, and contradictory actually as what uh, former senator and uh, AFP chief of staff General Biasi said that uh, the president himself in his address to the UN General Assembly, General Assembly in uh, last uh, September and again before the ASEAN in November, uh, he himself said that you know the uh, the arbitral award is is binding; it cannot be tampered with by any sitting administration. So, <laughs> uh, even us Filipinos are a little bit uh, confused about this. In that line of thinking, the Philippine Constitution, you know, is is uh, can can be can be said to also be just a piece of paper, right? If if that's one way of uh, looking at it, coming from a uh, Coming, uh, coming from a national leader. But of course, uh, I believe it is not so. It is a binding document. It is a permanent document. And there are processes to, to changing that. So uh, there's a bit of a confused situation here. But I think the rule of law, whether domestic or, or international, is quite clear about what, what needs to get done. Uh, the, the constitution, for instance, you know, the, the very basic uh, legal code, you know, they, they represent any nation's ethics, values, and morals even. And for, a, uh, and for a nation of faith like the Philippines, which is predominantly Christian, you know, our, our legal codes are really based on, on uh, moral codes, right? particularly the, the the, dec the Decalogue and the Sermon on the Mount, you know, because most of the faithful here are really uh, of the Judeo-Christian Judeo type. So, you know, we're talking here of, of the basic values, basic ethics, things that have been upheld for, uh, for, the, for almost the past century. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it would be alien to uh, just throw that out in the face of uh, in the face of a uh, regional power like like China, for instance, which has uh, radically different values, uh, you know, communism is not exactly the same as uh, a, a faith-based uh, uh, nationalism. Our neighbors ASEAN and the international community in general were ready to support our position, but we dropped the ball and decided to set aside the ruling and engage with uh, China bilaterally. Uh, Personally, I, I, I really do believe that a, a multilateral approach to the West Philippine Sea issue for the Philippines is, is the best option to, to adapt, uh, not, not the bilateral financing. So I'll talk more about that in the next slide. Um, uh, we'll go back to that, but, but in the meantime, talking about a credible defense posture for the Philippines, there's been talk recently about, you know, for, for instance, the acquisition of submarines, even if it's just uh, a diesel electric kind as opposed to the nuclear kind, because uh, the nuclear kind is, of course, way too expensive to, to modernize the Philippine Navy. Uh, basically, the, the armed force of the Philippines. Uh, and of course, people are saying that, oh, it's kind of too late to be able to... Well, it depends. Uh, if if uh, theoretically we are talking about just modernizing any armed forces, which is applicable to the Philippines as well as to any other country, then it, it makes a lot of sense to, to modernize your armed forces. Uh, talking in a more particular sense, though, especially in the Philippines and with regards to China, yeah, yeah, you can say that it's we're, we're kind of, it's a bit late, a little bit late, right? And it, it depends on on the adversary, but uh, but but there's still merit to modernizing your armed forces anyway, right? Uh, there's also another school of thought about uh, about asymmetric warfare. You know, the, the way to go against a superior enemy is to be able to take advantage of asymmetric warfare, which takes advantage of the 
the enemy's weakness and, and your your limited strength, but but which strikes at the enemy's uh, weakness, making making cost winning cost for that adversary very very painful and, and uh, expensive. All right, um, but so some of the for instance, if you adapt this asymmetric warfare type of the uh, advocacy in 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 modernize in quickly modernizing a a, uh, a an armed force like the Philippines against any potential adversary, then uh, it, it makes really it makes sense to to for example have a shopping list that is asymmetric in its in its in its goals. You know, uh, the Philippines cannot uh, quickly afford very expensive. Weapon items, but that it can afford, for instance, you know, uh, enhancing your, your your eyes to be able to see where the enemy is coming from. So you would you would need long range patrol aircraft, AWACS, and of course the continuation and expansion of offshore patrolling by the Coast Guard, by the Philippine Navy. Definitely, air defense systems of, of the Air Force, uh, anti-submarine. Warfare assets, and this can be this could be uh, well mainly surface if you are, you're a non-submarine nation. But uh, so these are these are small, mobile, but lethal uh, and and less expensive types of weaponry. Of course, marine minesweepers and mine layers. If we are anticipating, you know, uh, maritime uh, maritime vessels from uh, adversaries, like including especially surface surface vessels. And shore-based mobile anti-ship missile systems and the lot. But again, as you can see, the thinking is that you know the adoption of uh, more practical, less expensive, asymmetric weaponry to, to counter the, the weaknesses of even a strong, large adversary, which is doable for a for a, for a nation like the Philippines. All right. So, um, in some kind of a summary for my presentation, then again, you know. Uh, bottom line: How do we win the win the peace in the West Philippine Sea? I keep saying that the West Philippine Sea issue is really an issue that is quite straightforward, really, from from the point of view of not only defense and security personnel but every Filipino. Because here you have a situation wherein you know, right within your exclusive economic zone, which really becomes uh, part of your territory in the sense that uh, the country which has that EEZ only has the exclusive rights to the marine resources within that exclusive economic zone, which is 200 nautical miles from, from mainland. Uh, so any, any incursions uh, to that is obviously uh, unlawful and, and violative of, the, of, of any country's sovereignty. Even probably an act of war if, if those if vessels are armed, which uh, cannot be established unless you know, someone boards the, the vessels and inspect to see if those maritime vessels are indeed uh, armed. So, you know, the, the following are really very practical and uh, very effective. I think I would say uh, forces of, of, uh, of action to be adopted by the Philippines uh, with regards to the West Philippine Sea. First, we assert Philippine sovereignty backed up by international law, which we already have with the 2016 arbitral ruling. Second, to engage China and other claimants multilaterally, and uh, of course, to avoid being bullied in, in a bilateral confrontation, which is uh, sort of what is happening right now. Again, as I said earlier, the best way really is uh, a multilateral approach, wherein a, it just make, which makes a lot of sense for a weaker nation because it engages the support of the uh, international community. Okay. Then third, engage with China on the basis of equality among sovereign nations. It's again, emphasizing that this, the issue is not size, but uh, but quality, being both sovereign nations. And uh, I think the Philippines needs to reassert its sovereign sovereign uh, status a lot more than what is than how it's currently doing. Fourth, to strengthen ties with regional and international strategic partners. With shared interests, but also values, and uh, again, we already have that. Actually, for instance, in the case of the United States, we we have uh, you know uh, same same uh, almost 
uh, the same uh, values as uh, yeah uh, as them in, in terms of our politics and our culture. Um, also, take part in uh, in joint patrols. Are you um? Was there a glitch? Yeah, I yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, need to, I need to get back. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Um. Uh, oh, wait, wait. Let me let me just. Thank you. All right. There you go. All right. Um. Continuing on. Um. Well, fourth is to take part in joint patrol and other confidence and capacity building exercises with neighboring countries. We have, we we used to do. Uh, joint patrols. We just stopped in uh, September of 2016 because of uh, President Duterte's instructions to discontinue. But uh, we have been doing such before then. Maybe it's a it's a it's wise to perhaps you know uh, recontinue with that, and that would be possible if we if we go if we uh, went back to a multi multilateral engagement rather than just a bilateral. Okay. And there are so many joint patrols as well with, with other allies. And they're, and they're more than willing to, to do it with us through a uh, test of freedom of navigation through the South China Sea kind of thing. And just like this, uh, you know, uh, the, the aircraft carrier group from, from the UK, which is moving uh, towards the South China Sea just to test freedom of navigation. And it's been done before. It's, it continues to be done just to ensure that you know uh, international trade is maintained through the South China Sea, through the Strait of Malacca, which uh, includes uh, trillions of uh, worth of trade annually. Another thing is to invest in Coast Guard and increase law enforcement presence. It's uh, being done currently to some extent. I think it needs to be expanded. There's like uh, four boats from the Coast Guard and uh, some maritime presses from the BPAR. And uh, some patrols by the uh, maritime group of the Philippine National Police. I think it needs to get expanded. Uh, since the incursions, the, uh, the armed forces have sent four uh, uh, boats from the Philippine Navy and one from the Coast Guard. And I, I, I think this needs to be sustained and even expanded uh, because <laughs> because the 287 Chinese maritime vessels are still there and uh, doesn't seem like they have any intention of, of, uh, of leaving. All right, invest in cost-effective military assets, and that's that continues to be done as well. Uh, my good friend and underclassman, uh, Admiral Bacordo, of the, is just bowing out of the of the flag officer in command of the Philippine Navy. You know, he said that uh, he was supposed to to uh, to procure you know, like three diesel and electric submarines and uh, some frigates and corvettes. Before he bowed out, but uh, it was postponed due to the due to COVID. So if it might, if it doesn't happen in the second quarter of this year, then it will happen the first semester of next year. All right, and and then exploit more of the resources in our own easy meaning. You know, uh, more Filipinos should should I guess become residents of uh, of our little I I islands in, in the south in the West Philippine Sea, not just the people in Pagasa. And uh, I hope. Uh, we can really establish our presence more there than, than, than ever. There, we already have a couple of buy there, so I think we can probably uh, have more. So we are in need of volunteers to, uh, to reside in, the, uh, in our little islands in the West Philippines. So uh, <clears throat> that completes my presentation. I'd be ready and happy to answer any of your questions. So, uh, if there are any? Um, thanks. Thank you so much, Colonel Jacob. I'm going to call Sam to join me now. Um, let me just stop this screen share. <clears throat> um, Colonel Jacob, can you end your, okay. Sorry, can you end your presentation? Can you turn off the share? Okay, let me just do this. Okay. 
Okay. Um, any Sam, do you want to start the sure conversation? Thank you, Dennis. Uh, there's a couple questions uh, in Q and A. So, first one from Michael Kepler, who, if I'm not mistaken, is or was with the U.S. Embassy. Um, what is your view on leveraging the quad as a counterbalance? Um, I think it's already, to a certain extent, uh, working, working in the sense that you have the U.S., Australia, Japan, and India uh, standing their ground, uh, especially, I think, with regards to the, the Taiwan issue, for instance. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of saber rattling from, from China recently on, on Taiwan. And, you know, some people even go as far as to say uh, that, uh, you know, uh, China will indeed retake Taiwan. And I think support has been given, uh, even from Quad to Taiwan in this regard. So, so uh, from that, it, it seems like it seems like uh, what means it means business, and, uh, and uh, I hope so. I hope so that they do. But from what uh, what has been shown on the ground, uh, yeah, I think they've done some some action to to give and show support to Taiwan in this regard. Uh, we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Congress is soon going to enact the Public Services Act, uh, which if the House version passes will permit China Telecom, for example, to own 100% of Dito Telecoms. Based on your assessment, would it be prudent to permit China to take on such a strategic position in the Philippines? And the same applies to the National Grid Corporation. Yeah. Oh, personally, I'm so, I'm so against that. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, services like power, communications, even transport uh, to, uh, you know, from perspective of uh, public administrationists, these are considered perfect public goods, meaning, you know, it's best in the hands of locals than, than foreigners because of their national security implications. And so I think there's real, real danger there if we give it to foreign providers, especially if uh, if they're Chinese, considering that it is China that, that we're having some problem with, uh, with regards to our sovereign. So uh, to me personally, uh, of course, I'm so against that. And to me, it doesn't make sense at all. Uh, and, uh, and Congress, you know, with due respect to them, I think they made a huge mistake in allowing that. that should never have happened because it's like surrendering our national security to to a country that has been threatening. It, 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 it would be different if it was another country, but it's, it's, if, it, it would, if it's the same uh, country and, and if the, and I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, it, it, that the providers will be, I, I think that hasn't been concretized yet, but, but, but there's uh, a lot of talk and, and a lot has happened already within, within our country wherein Chinese providers have actually in the, the, the winning, the primary bidders. So there's, there's a concrete danger there, I think. Hopefully, uh, if, it's, if it's not Chinese, then probably well and good. But still, the concept of you know putting it put, putting these strategic uh, industries in the hands of foreigners, I think it's, it's a big threat to national security. What, what do you perceive to be the weaknesses of China? Because you were saying that you know, if we were more strategic about the way we engage with China in, in the West Philippine Sea, in terms of our investments in, in um, you know, our equipment, um, military equipment and maritime equipment, what what are those weaknesses? Oh, yeah, well, um, yeah, well, in terms of the, just the tactical aspect of it, um, it, it I know there there would be there would be some uh, again if we look back into the context of the uh, uh, Vietnam War, for instance, right? You you have there an example of asymmetric warfare, where where in a uh, weaker uh, 
nation militarily like Vietnam was able to defeat much stronger uh, military protagonists like like uh, France and uh, the U.S. Okay. But in terms of uh, more than that, in terms of a more strategic uh, perspective, again, I, I try. I like to connect the, the strategic goal of, of China not only with individual countries in the Philippines, but with regards to the world, the rest of the world, and because it's, I, I think it's very much connected with how they deal with individual countries, including the Philippines, and also connected to their own domestic issues, like you know, providing for their you know huge population, limited resources, and all of that. Then, of course, uh, attaining their goals, as I have said earlier in my presentation about Xi Jinping's uh, strategic vision of, of what they want to achieve uh, on the run down to 2049. So I think every, everything is, is uh, connected. Strategically, I think a weakness of China is the fact that it tries to impose a new world order that is really very much unlike the world. Uh, I talk of values, for instance. How do you impose a totalitarian uh, non-faith system on the rest of the world when much of the world is unlike that? How do you impose a, an order that is based more on fear rather than on love, for instance? You know, the rest of the world is not exactly like China. China is a unique organism by itself. I, I, it, it cannot be copied. It cannot be modeled by any other country. And I think we are already seeing that from pushback from uh, its BRI engagement. I mean, I mean, just look at all the BRI, BRI partners. And, you know, many of them do not want to continue with China. You know, they would rather engage with some other country. So given that alone... Uh, even in the Philippines, you know, Philippines is predominantly, you know, the Pearl of the Orient Seas, you know, uh, even if we are Asian, but we are the most westernized Asian in, in our part of the world, right? Under Spain, under uh, the U.S., so our political system, our culture is is, is uh, vastly different. And so I think there's a big problem there when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, partnering with, with a country like communist China on a, in a on a profound level or sense. But, um, do you see any, um, I wanted to ask, um, Xi Jinping has just, is president for life, right? I mean, is that, yeah. has that been formalized? More or less, right? But <laughs> yeah. do you see, yeah, yeah. Do, do you see any reformist elements emerging from the CPP or it's, it's very much entrenched this whole, you know, um, Re recovering China's lost glory, and you're talking about 1949, and you know the shame uh, of defeat, and you know, kind of emerging from all that, a world superpower again. And so, do you yeah. think reformist elements will ever? I mean, reformists have always been like, well, there was Deng Xiaoping who kind of paved the way, and then that Hu Yaobang, am I correct? But you yeah. know, he he was, you know, he didn't get anywhere, right? So. Is there a possibility? We've seen the crackdown in Hong Kong, so I'm sure. I'm sure there are reformists even within the Communist Party. There are always are people with different uh, with links from the uh, from the remaining powers. I'm sure there is. But uh, again, we have to understand that uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party, especially when it comes to their internal situation or condition, there. That's a very guarded secret, right? That, that, that never comes out, all right? And the way their process works, like you said, you know, Xi Jinping is is technically in for life. So, you know, they went through that process and they see him that way. Uh, I'm sure, you know, if there are any uh, suggestions, I'm sure that's communicated within the party. And I'm sure the leader takes note of that. But, uh, but I think, you know, early on from the, when, when he took over in 2012, right? You know, the party as a whole, or at least most of them anyway, they're, all, they're sold out to the, to the Xi Jinping vision, all right? And so, uh, well, problems have, have, have surfaced recently, like the pandemic, like, like the, uh, there's a current meltdown uh, in China right now, you know, uh, and uh, but of course we don't hear much of that <laughs> because that's that's part of the strategy. I guess they don't really you know the, the 
Chinese Communist Party is not one to to uh, flaunt weaknesses. It's all strength. So, but but there are there are kings in the in the Chinese armor. Uh, for instance, you know even the pronouncement from Xi Jinping recently when he said that oh you know let's be more let's let's exude you know love more you know love <laughs> it's, it 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 felt kind of straight to to some of them because uh, and and I guess it's he's really pointing at. Maybe we're we're uh, appearing to be too much of a you know too, too coming on too strong to the rest of the world and you know there's we're getting a lot of pushback for that that's why he's probably saying oh we need to soften up a bit you know? so that even that is already a a sign of uh, and and the, the Chinese economy is also showing some cracks it, it's big but it's it's uh, reeling from the pandemic and, and from its overextended engagements throughout the world so I'm, I'm sure. They're discussing this within the party. Uh, that is why they're they're more aggressive, for instance, in the South China Sea, because you know South China Sea will always represent what for one food security uh, in the present and the future, even oil and gas reserves. That's you know, and and of course the, the projection of uh, power at the same time. So they're already sold sold out with that. So it's it's happening simultaneously, you know, uh, food security to to feed a 1.4 billion population. Uh, despite limited resources and and this ambitious ambitious uh, vision to become the next superpower, it's a big challenge. Do you think the China issue is something that the ordinary man, like the voter, the you know the ordinary voter here in the Philippines, would understand and give importance to? Oh yes, most definitely. Uh, even I, you know, I've been, you can't help talking to some of the. The, the, the ordinary folk, even I am surprised at, at their, at their, uh, some of the things they say because I talk to enough people who told me that, oh, you know, I'm sorry to say, but uh, they probably won't be able to, to uh, really relate with what's happening out there. But I'm surprised, you know, I've talked to some, you know, mix, mixture of people like uh, some Baha'i or, or a driver or a waiter or a, or a farmer or and, and they, they say yeah, yeah they're they're not happy they're not happy with what's going on out there because they see that that we're being sold out that's what they, they say that they say that no oh, uh, like you know things like that uh, they, they know that and so i think i think even if uh people come from different social classes doesn't mean that uh, they don't feel or realize uh, what is at stake out there. And I think the sovereignty issue is, is something else. I think it, it uh, it's not your usual uh, thing that people, even the masa cannot understand. I think they do because it is something that is different. It is about, it does, and it's, all, it's also something that's related to food security because it affects uh, our fisher folk. I mean, billions of, uh, there's been an estimate of billions of things pesos uh, being lost out there annually and uh, and and the word word gets out uh, the fisher folk right there in Palawan they're the ones who who, who are uh, public about it and it's all over media too um, Dennis, we've got lots of good engagement so running right along what should the Philippine strategy be in dealing with China's maritime militia Go back to uh, look. Uh, to me, it's better approach from top down rather than bottom up. Uh, go back to multilateral engagement. You know, let's stop this bilateral thing because it's a no win for us uh, in a bilateral engagement. You know, you, you say bilateral obviously says well, it's just China and the Philippines, right? And if we limit it to that, then yeah, uh, no way because even just the 2016 arbitral award is a multilateral uh, development. It's not a bilateral, and that is what we should have built on since 2016. It's to our advantage. We we cannot we cannot even we may not even talk about uh, you know military engagement if we just you know if we just push the arbitral award and, and that that shuts the door on military engagements because that's the weapon of uh, of uh, we, we, already, we are already in the 21st century and supposedly 
there's there's no need to go to a war that may escalate into kinetic nuclear war that annihilates everybody. So that's definitely not the way to go. The way to go is just let's, let's talk it out, man. Let's talk it out as as a as a group of nations, not just between one and two. David and Goliath. There are, sure. um, there have been suggestions, for example, that maybe the Philippines should deploy its own maritime militia. Vietnam has its own maritime militia. Um, I'm curious what you think about that, but I'm also going to jump in with my opinion there, which is that kind of related to what you said, this is a problem that should be addressed top down. The, the problem with the bottom is you potentially have, which is the situation Vietnam has, um, your maritime militia is not particularly well trained, not particularly well equipped, and the opportunity for them to escalate almost by accident uh, is potentially more risky than you want. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I, again, uh, and and but but then again, it's a little bit different with them because they're 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 open to a multilateral engagement, right? Unlike us. So you're you're talking about what goes on on the ground practically, and uh, but I think it uh, it wouldn't really matter as much as. The, what what goes on from from the top down? If the if the preferred strategy is multilateral, then then naturally the actions down below echo echo that uh, strategy from the top. So there's really for as long as they're aligned, I guess it's it's okay. You know, uh, it's not it's not like the tactical units dictating the the policy, but but rather they're just enforcing it. Hmm. So there's no, really no no inconsistency there. But it's different with with ours. Is if we we'll, I just say multilateral engagement, then we also can see the repercussion of that on the ground. Uh, for instance, you know, I mean, we, we are, our, our fisher folk are actually prevented from <laughs> from fishing in our own EEZ. So, uh, you know, what can you say about that? It's, it's, so, uh, it's so ironic. And, and speaking <laughs> of policy from the top, next question is, how can Philippine government bureaucrats defend the Philippines' claim in the West Philippine Sea when the president's own words about the ruling, as we said, is just a piece of paper? Yeah, well, well, they're supposed to to assert their their uh, independence, being a third leg of the balance of power in our country. We have three co-equal branches of government, and they comprise the legislative. And if they exercise their own independent uh, mindset. I think, I think they would. I mean, how come uh, ordinary Filipinos or ordinary folks can see uh, the the incongruence of, of what's happening in the in the West Philippine Sea relative to our constitution and our own? You know, uh, lawmakers cannot see that, I and mean, that, that's that's so strange to me. You know? So I think they would uh, have been doing a greater service to the Filipino nation if they would have been exercising their own independence of mind rather than just, uh, overwhelming the, uh, you know, they're acting like almost like a stamp pad to the executive. And that's, I don't think it's, that's, uh, that's good uh, in the sense of our concept of uh, balance of power. You know, well, it certainly seems that SND Lorenzana and SFA Loxin, especially recently, have been a little bit more bold in, in their statements. Uh, what, what do you make of that? Yeah, that was actually very positive. And I think a lot of people were happy with that, <laughs> including me. <laughs> so, and it's well within their, their roles as, uh, you know, as such, as, as cabinet members uh, for the defense and for, for uh, foreign affairs. I think they were just exercising what they were expected to do on behalf of, of the Philippines. So, uh, so there should be more of that, I think. Sure. Be more of that. Uh, if you don't mind, there's a question which, as a security analyst, I'm going to go ahead and answer. Um, go ahead, sir. <laughs> is there any influence China has on internal problems of the Philippines, such as the NPA or Islamic insurgents? Um, you know, the history of the communist insurgency is, nope. serves its own webinar yeah. and many, many volumes yeah. of books. Mm -hmm. uh, the short answer is no, not recently. Uh, mainland China broke off its support for the NPA uh, many decades ago. Ironically, if you listen to the way that um, the Communist Party of the Philippines talks today, you know they're they're all up in arms about um, 
saying that this administration is doing a lousy job of protecting our sovereignty. So they're definitely um, on a different side of that issue. Uh, as far as uh, Islamic uh, insurgents, there's really no evidence um, that China has an interest in, in supporting those groups. Um, yeah. I suppose, you know, uh, there are ways and means of influencing um, events on, on domestic politics are, you know, a little more, uh, shall we say, straight to the top uh, these days. Yeah. Well, um, when I was still in active service, yeah, there was a time when, uh, when, uh, uh, when China was uh, believed to be supporting our domestic insurgents here. And, uh, you know, that's, that's all on public record. Even if you go back even to the time of President Marcos, you know, uh, that, that was so. There's this incident, for instance, the MV Cargatan, you know, wherein they, they actually, you know, our security services actually intercepted uh, military support coming from, from outside into our local insurgents, you know. So these are all the, of course, that, that changed, as you said, Sam. Uh, and with regards to their statement uh, about uh, Philippine sovereignty, I guess yeah, on there, there are two sides there. You know, you can say that they're also, you know, Filipinos and they're probably exercising their, you know, their uh, love for for the country. But also at the same time, uh, and and they've been like that even when I was in active service. And they're also good at propaganda. Okay, so they, of course they they mount things that are that are uh, supportive of their cause. So. And uh, for them, everything is, of course, you know, and justifies the means, so they're able to, to mouth just about uh, anything, really, to, to further their cause. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know, it's uh, sincere or true or whatever, but uh, but it's definitely in furtherance of their cause. That's how it's been, and, and that's how we dealt with them, even before. Absolutely. Um, next question. Uh, actually, th there are two, and I think they're related. So the first is, how do you think the Philippines could conduct asymmetric warfare against China? Um, the next question uh, related to that is, is the purchase of the BrahMos anti-ship missiles, uh, which are produced by India, still on deck? What is the status? Um, and do you find it strange that it's the Philippine Air Force to have operation of control over the Philippine Navy? I, I, I'm afraid I can't say much about the, the second question because I don't really have uh, any uh, uh, credible info on that. But, uh, but but with the first one, uh, asymmetric warfare, well, I think it begins with, again, from the top down, really. You know, uh, I think it's easier to conduct asymmetric warfare against a regional power like China if, uh, you know, if uh, uh, we do not see the uh, the confusing states that we do see sometimes in our in our own country, like uh, for instance, conflicting statements coming from the president himself, things like that, you know, that seem to uh, uh, because we do by now. Of course, we are all aware that you know there's this uh, pivot to China that's been adopted by the Philippine leader. So you know, it's probably understandable in, understandable in, in that way. But uh, but again, going back to your question about uh, having a, a an adversary like that, uh, and then of course our only chance if we were pushed to it is an asymmetric warfare as we've been covering it up. Then, then uh, it would apply to any adversary really that is much stronger than, than us. But in the in a particular case of what's going on in our own country right now, it's it's of course it's, uh, it's strange to talk about it when uh, when we are not sure. Really, if the adversary is an uh, enemy, is is a uh, is a friendly or foe, so that's why I say it's you know it, it has to be from the top down. Then you know the rest of the security services will just follow through. So, but but it, it's it's uh, so much easier to do that when it's clear that. Uh, when it's clear what the status of the enemy is, who the enemy is, and uh, and if the if the entire nation is uh, united against that enemy, it's a uh, it's a it's a little bit different if uh, if uh, we are divided against that enemy because of uh, unclear states of loyalty. 
Yeah, fair enough. Um, and, you know, just to give uh, whoever asked that question some sense of what we're really talking about, you know, asymmetric warfare, what it boils down to, at least in this case, is how do you blow something up expensive very cheaply? If we try to outcompete with China in terms of building and acquiring naval assets, we will lose that game. If we figure out how to neutralize the naval assets for a fraction of the price that it costs them, we, we've dramatically changed the cost benefit analysis. Okay. Um, so next uh, question here is, how would you assess the importance of geoeconomics for the Philippines in light of election in the coming year, a new Biden administration and the impression that the closer cooperation with China in recent years has maybe not shown the expected results? Can you, can you say that again, Sam? Like to, uh, that's a very uh, deep question. It is. It's a, um, it's a good question. I, I, I guess, you know, it's, I think what we're getting at is kind of a forward looking uh, assessment. We've got a new administration in the United States. We're winding up to the end of this administration. And a lot of the money that was promised early on um, related to say the build, build, build program hasn't really materialized. Do you, do you see that as you know, kind of the beginnings of, of a change in tact moving forward? Uh, oh, definitely, definitely. Well, the, of course, the 2022 uh, coming election is a game changer for the Philippines, obviously. It will really you know, define everything, what, what, depend, depending on the, the outcome, depending on the outcome. Uh, so, well, part of the question, we, uh, we don't really know what will come, you know, the, the promise. Uh, well, I, think, I, I think part of the question is also, as we're emerging out of COVID, there's now growth, right? That's, that's being forecasted. Can we actually survive without Chinese investment is maybe, I mean, a big part of the question, I think. And do we have the support of the Biden administration, say, in in um, fending off China or? Yeah. You know? Well, yeah. In, in, yeah. In that regard, I think the the West, under the leadership of uh, the U.S. and the G7, are beginning to. It, 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 President Biden just came up with a statement, right? They are now, you know, really formalizing pushback against uh, against China, given their very recent G7 meeting, right? So they're beginning to really, and you know, they're adopting, you know, for instance, you know, trying to veer away from uh, from whatever probably you know uh, other uh, alternative providers that they can partner with uh, besides China, because because every, every, that, so I think that they're beginning to do that. They're beginning to do that under the so yeah. In in terms of, I think there's a both a practical and a, an ideological element to the question, you know. Uh, yeah, practically, especially in the beginning, I, I think the world will reel, reel from disengagement with, with China, definitely, because of the, just the sheer volume of that trade involved, right? But at the same time, uh, there seems to be no choice too, right? Especially if uh, it boils down to, to uh, you know, this new world order thing that probably the, the rest of the world would, would agree with. So they have really no choice but to, to veer more towards a more a more ideological part of it, and that's I think what what the Western democracies are trying to do now. And so the rest of us, including including other democracies, will 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 have no well, I don't know what the, have, having no choice is the right word, but you know we're expected to go as well towards that direction. And and there are other other providers too, you know, it may be a little bit more expensive at first, but eventually it will, the, the world will, the trade, the world trade uh, 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 movement will, will adjust. It's always like that, isn't it? Uh, and, and of course, knowing the, the, the nature of capitalism, others will, will come to the void that will be created by a, a, by a non, uh, 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 non uh, partnership with the, uh, non-trade partnership with China. Um, our next question comes from Mr. Fando, who is saying that taking into account that the South China Sea is surrounded by many straits that China is not controlling, Malacca Strait being one, 
and that China has many shortcuts through its mainland to both sides of India, is the maritime connectivity of the South China Sea really so important nowadays? Um, is it not much more important um, that Taiwan and its access to blue waters uh, is more important? Um, so ba basically, the, the question is just um, how, how important really is the South China Sea for uh, its uh, maritime routes? To China, it's very important. To China, it's very important because it forms part of its about uh, goals under Xi Jinping's uh, 2049 dream. Hmm. They, it's not just for uh, just for uh, pragmatic considerations, but but I think it's really both. You know, they're they're in it for uh, for both for uh, reestablishing their you know their, their pride for 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 practical reasons as well, uh, like food security. Uh, there, there's Taiwan that they want to regain back under, you know, part of greater China. They just uh, look, I think, at South China Sea as more of a uh, of a uh, uh, superpower status trophy than anything else. I mean, just the fact that they, they have a different way of seeing it. I mean, they, they actually treat South China Sea as their uh, their territorial water. Right. So there's strange, both a... strange as it may seem to us, but that's how, that's how they see it, and that's how they've been behaving. They've actually established, you know, as if it's really their own now, like at Scarborough and even at uh, Whitson Reef now, and that that's their thinking. They're you know, it, it's our territory. We're not leaving. We're staying. And so whatever happens, then you know, come what may, we all, we've already built permanent structures here. So you know, what are you going to do about it? Right. So there's both a practical and a, you can say, like a prestige component to this. Yeah. Um, and then, and Xi Jinping said it. He said, you know, that's the price of every uh, uh, superpower. You know, we, we, we need to do it. We need to be backed up by a strong military. And uh, we're doing it because we want to, to regain back our uh, pride lost from, from uh, years of humiliation under, under the West. Yeah. And I guess, you know, the only thing I'd, throw in on top of that is on the practical side of things, overland transport, um, even if it's viable, it's, it's just never going to be competitive in terms of cost and, and in terms of the volume of goods yeah. as, as seaborne transport. Right. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're coming up to the end of our time. I've got three more questions. Uh, so the next one is, do you think that another incident such as the 2012 Scarborough standoff uh, would be possible in the future. Mm. But, uh, it's similar to what is happening now, right? Is that, is that, is that, uh, yeah. Uh, um, from from the features that are there right now, it seems like the the San Felipe is one of the one of the final structures that the the, the Chinese you know intended to, to occupy. Okay, they're pretty much exhausted mm -hmm. what's out there. So, but yeah, but, but yeah, the, 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 quick, the quick answer to the question is, yeah, the Chinese are willing to, to do whatever it takes, I think, to, to if, if they think that it's still needed. But I think given what's in the um, EEZ of the Philippines from Scarborough to, to uh, Calayan down to to San Felipe, you can pretty much see that they've sort of like exhausted what's what's out there in our West Philippine Sea from north to south, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't see any much, any more features that they need to, to occupy uh, for a standoff. The the, the the current one, I think, the final one is uh, San Felipe, right? And, and there's not much out there left anymore. They, most are like sub submerged uh, reefs and uh, islets. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah, the, I think China. Is, is is ready and willing to, to to go at it because they're capable. And they think that there's nothing much we can do anyway. Um, uh, next question: uh, asking, What are your thoughts on the negotiations uh, for the code of conduct in the South China Sea? Continue on, continue on. It's something that we've started even before the arbitral award, right? We've, mm -hmm. We have had a lot of difficulty before the uh, the Hague ruling, but now that we have the Hague ruling. Uh, it's, I think it's really, you know, it's really made everything so much easier if we only uh, pursue it. 
you know, it, it sets the, the standard, it sets the precedent for any of for the uh, any of the other claimants to do the same. Uh, and it just makes everyone behave according to UNCLOS. And that, that's, that's, that's really what we can do, right? I mean, to make everyone behave according to the international rule of law, because uh, what else is there, you know, if, if they don't, then you know, what does that mean? Uh, and then the, we are all members of the UN, including China, and we're supposed to just talk about this. Would China willingly vacate the islands, the, the reefs, if they were, if it came to that? Well, that's, a, that's another question, yeah, right? Yeah, they, they, so far they've been given all the, the chances and they haven't taken it. So yeah. that's an indicator of, of, of their behavior. But I think I think there's a, a revisit to the United Nations Charter and, uh, and how seriously members uh, take it. Should be, it should be mm -hmm. done, I think. Because, for instance, for instance, you have you know you have members that are signatories, but they don't observe what they sign. So you know what are we going to do about it, right? So I think there's yeah. a need to, to uh, but then again, I know that it's understandable that you, that the United Nations would be hesitant to expel any member because it would be against their mm -hmm. their about intention. It's really world peace since World War II, and they don't want to really antagonize anyone. And I think that's being exploited by uh, by certain members like China. But but I think it needs to be revisited because we need the, the compliance of, of of every member. Otherwise the you know the far extreme to that is unthinkable. It's you know, uh, even even the, the uh, this new world order again we just take in global scale and if you follow through with that and there's no you know there's no amicable settlement then what what, what do you think, right? What, where does it lead towards? It leads towards uh, world disorder. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's dangerous for, for the rest of the world. Yes, yeah. uh, I guess, you know, the point is that we need some sort of order that goes beyond just, you know, whoever is the strongest gets to dictate to the rest of everyone else. That's kind of the story of the 20th century and everything that people have fought so hard to, to build, right? Yeah, and if there's been some, uh, if, if, if some nation probably felt it was uh, treated unfairly or unjust, then let's, let's let's talk about it. You know, let's let's uh, deal with it in a in a more civilized way, not necessarily you know, uh, going at it by 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 force or or like 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 uh, exactly what's happening with the Philippines, where you know, mm -hmm. uh, our, our uh, our natural resources are being forcibly taken over. And that's, that's a very good example. So short of that, you know, that's, that's, uh, and that, that's the very intention of the United Nations really. And any other, and any other subgroup, right? Like even the ASEAN, even every, everything really. So, and um, um, it's just, uh, it's just a different, uh, Oh, we're just seeing, I think, a very different set of of, of, of uh, values and uh, that, that are like like really uh, uh, going at each other right now. There's a need to, you know, how do you dialogue with that? How do you, you know, hey, you know, even if we're so far off with our values, then can can we talk about, you know, let's go back and just, because, you know, the the, the Far extreme to, to this is just unthinkable. You don't want to be headed again to another war. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I think this is the perfect question to end on um, from Mr. Miguel Ayala. Assuming everything goes right, tensions de escalate, multilateral talks go smoothly enough that we get a peaceful and shared South China Sea. What do you think this might look like? In other words, what is our ideal end state that we should be aiming for? It, 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 uh, yeah, it sounds like uh, what would be happening if uh, this standoff with, uh, with China were not there. So we can see you know, the situation before, before all this happened. Uh, now it's, uh, it's it's winnable because of the of the ruling, with the favorable ruling. It's it's it's, it's a lot. I, I can still remember when I was in active service, and you know, it, it was really a problem. You know, with, without the arbitral award, and, you know, it's even just the code of 
conduct was seen as uh, already a victory for all. You know, there's really there's just a standoff that no one's willing to to give in, and uh, and short of just to, to the extent that just uh, not shooting at each other is really considered a an acceptable victory. But but with the award, you know that that's every, that sets everything straight. We have this uh, international law actually that says, oh, so we have made a ruling, then let this be a model. Okay, it's more than the code of conduct. It's the model that uh, it's more than the code of conduct really, because the code of conduct was being pursued at the time because of, of, of in the absence of any arbitral award. But with with the uh, Hague ruling. You know, it's it's more than the code of conduct. You know, it the, the ruling itself already sets the, the code of conduct. All, all the all the nation, all the claimants need to do is to, to abide by it. Uh, they're signatories anyway, unless they're not, uh, including China. So we, we see a a going back to normal, peaceful coexistence among nations. Uh, and uh, I wish to see. I wish you, we could go back to that. Uh, a, 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 but but a lot of it hinges on China. China will have to accept the the ruling and not insist with its uh, nine dashed line, because that, that's that's really if it gives that up, then fine, we can all be you know happy and uh, peacefully coexisting. But a lot depends on China right now. All right. Yeah. Thank I think you. that's a yeah, it's a great note to end on. Um, thank you so much, Colonel Alcop. That was just a very comprehensive discussion of the situation. I mean, you went into history and, you know, you went a little bit into the future and geopolitics and all that. So it's given us a really great overview of, you know, what, what, could, what, which direction we could possibly take. And again, while underlining the importance of this as an issue, the issue of sovereignty in the upcoming election. So on that note, I'd like to thank you so much for being with us today. I'd like to thank all our attendees for joining in members and non-members alike. I just want to remind everyone that um, from tomorrow, Manila House will be open at 40% capacity indoors. So our main dining room opens and um, we all welcome you there, members. And um, if non-members want to come, please come with a with a member. We'll, you're, you're most welcome. And, um, and also membership is open. So we're accepting applications for membership as well. Um, Sam, thank you for joining me today. As usual, it's a pleasure. Uh, we look forward to more um, more webinars with you and more um, provocative topics. I <laughs> think. Um, thank you again for sharing your expertise, Colonel Akop, and yeah, your experience. Yeah. Thanks so much, Rubina. Uh, Sam, thanks so much. It's my, it's my pleasure. Thank you. And um, this webinar will be up in a day or so in our uh, the Manila House. YouTube channel. So just go to YouTube, look for Manila House Private Club, and you'll find um, all our videos uploaded there. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye.